some context on what's going on in Peru. If, uh, everybody got familiar with it. Uh, uh, President Pedro Castillo came to power in 2021 in Peru with popular support from the poor and indigenous people. His term has been continuously hampered by a right-wing dominated Congress and it has also tried to remove him. And uh, in December 2022, President Castillo attempted to temporarily dissolve the Congress, but it was not a success. He was not supported by the judiciary and the military. His uh, attempt failed and then he was arrested and the then Vice President Dina Boluarte became the, became the president. Since then, massive protests have been taking place all over Peru in, flavor, in favor of Castillo's release and Boluarte's resignation. In as uh, against the protest, the government forces have been cracking down really hard. Uh, civil rights has been constrained. The University of San Marcos, who have been active in organizing the protests in Lima, the capital, uh, have been brutally assaulted by the police using armored vehicles and tear gas. Over 200 students have been arrested. Uh, protesters have even been labeled terrorists. We think this discussion on Peru is crucial because Peru has been an inspiration for leftist movements all over the world and especially in Latin America. It has seen multiple people's uprising and uh, mass movements. And, and in, in this context, we think it is uh, very crucial for leftists all over the world to understand and analyze what is going on there. Uh, even though there's been some coverage in mainstream media on what is going to be what is going on in Peru, it's been very minimal. There's been a lack of ambiguity and clarity, and most coverage by international media has supported the new regime and have constantly portrayed President Castillo as some kind of a left-wing extremist who came to who tried to snatch power undemocratically. And before we move on to questions, uh, Sebastian, just a short introduction about Collective, our organization. Collective is a revolutionary student youth organization that has been operating in uh, cities in India for the, for the past few years. We've been continuously trying to cover issues of international importance to the left and bring more atten attention to them in India. Uh, we also bring out uh, a magazine that uh, also covers international issues. Our last issue had covered the uh, protests in Chile and their demand for a new constitution extensively. For those in the audience, uh, we constantly update our website collective-india.com with uh, interviews, articles and opinion pieces on uh, in issues that have been important in India and internationally. We are also on social media in um, Facebook and Instagram. So uh, can we start with the question, Sebastian? <coughs> Yes, of course, we can. Thank you, Yai. So, uh, can you first give us an overall uh, introduction to the issue? What has been happening in Peru since December 2021 where, uh, when Castillo came to power and what was the conditions that led to him coming to power? What, wh How were the conditions uh, before these elections in Peru such that it uh, gave rise to this kind of a popular uh, uh, support base for President Castillo? You. Okay, um, well, um, things in Peru are very much uh, at the same time simple and complicated, right? So, um, there's a, I'd, I'd say that there's a, a, so yeah, we have a class relations in Peru are very much also racial relations. Uh, you have uh, a, 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 there's a, a very strong colonial component mm. in our society, as you may know, and much more than in other countries in Latin America. Because I know I don't know if you if you go to Chile or, or mainly Argentina or Uruguay, for example, you have a, a much less of a, a racial tension of, of, of racial divisions. Uh, here, most of the popular movement, most of the popular classes peasants and, uh, and working class are people from Andean descent. We're very strong Andean descent. We are much more like Bolivia in that sense. And uh, the, the people in, in the, the mainly the, the 
the bourgeoisie capitalists. Not all of them, but most of them. And the ones who have a longer history in this country are people from European descent. Uh, what we call Creole, right? Um, La Petit Bourgeoisie is much more mixed, but it's historically it has also been white. Right now it's growing and, it, and, and it's more diverse than before, but it, it tended to be uh, more mostly Creole. And that popular camp that has been for, for a lot of time uh, segregated and, and oppressed and exploited, you know, and dismissed from basic uh, rights, not only economic rights, but also political, social rights, you know, cultural rights, you know, the languages, most of them have disappeared and, and their culture has been uh, like um, pointed as a inferior backwards culture that has to be suppressed, you know, they, they, that many of the political um, actions from the state in the, the 20th century and, and Mariate in the intention to westernize you know, the popular uh, camp, you know, because if not eradicating it, you know, because you have it more, you had more extremist views that were more um, uh, neo-fascism, you know, so, you know, liberals, were for westernization and con conservatives and I, I'd say fascistic mostly have been from extermination, you know, cultural or, or in all. No? That's been, but I, I'm talking about there in the, the, the first half of the 20th century, right? You also have uh, this country for many years, at least until the 60s, has been mostly is not entirely feudal. You know, the, the, the relations in, 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 the, in the country were, uh, it, it, you know, the, what we call the Ascendados, you know, the leaders of the, of the asset to the state or the or its laws. Would that uh, kind of translate to, sorry to interrupt you, like, oh, would that be kind of like a uh, corporate or bourgeoisie? Uh, uh, yeah, like, like the, the Ascendados are like, um, how would I say, that, that, like um, the owners of the land, you know, the, on, the owners of the plantations, the, 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 you know, the, the, like the, the cousins of the, yeah. of, the, of the bourgeoisie in the coast. Uh, they, they took back in the 19th century when, after the independence, they took uh, and privatized most of the indigenous lands and they became the the, the lords you know, the landlords you know, of, of in the country and even though it was the the cultural or or sanguineal cousins in power at the, in, in lima at the state they were mostly autonomous and independent and they mo did most what but they what they think back in the country. You know? So there was very, very strong, very much strong uh, oppression and exploitation of the peasants and the indigenous movements uh, outside of Lima, right? Uh, that's not to say that Lima was uh, somehow more progressive or whatever, not at all. You know? It's just that it was socially different. You know? The organization in Lima was different. And the oppression and exploitation was different. But uh, these groups were excluded uh, from their political. Uh, they didn't allow people, for example, uh, with who couldn't read or write in Spanish. You no, know, they, they 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 weren't allowed to to vote to use their. You know, from from a liberal perspective, they were excluded. You know, it's it's not just that they were oppressed in the classical Marxian Marxian sense. If they were also from a democratic liberal perspective they were also excluded no so you have a you had a you didn't, you never had before the 60s this a uh, proper liberal democracy you had a, 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 a very much a feudal society 
where peasants and indigenous people were didn't have uh, all of the rights of a citizen. You know, they were explicitly second-class citizens. And the landlords were very much violent, many of them. Many of them were very violent. Not all of them, probably, but they did have an old, uh, uh, the class difference in the, uh, in the country was almost just like you know, because you were born as a peasant and you were, uh, you had to work for the landlord and there was no way of, oh, there was almost no way of escaping that because you owed to the landlord who didn't pay you but a salary, right? You you had to, uh, they paid you in resources, you know, for food or, or alcohol and, and they gave you these uh, kind of uh, tickets that you could exchange in the markets that were owned by the landlords. So it was very much futile. And so you have, we have a, the, the first half of the 20th century is a popular struggle for the land, mostly. Mariate also talks about that, you know, because I don't know if you have uh, had the chance to, to, to look at uh, Mariate is seven pieces about um, Peruvian uh, seven is on the interpretation of Peruvian reality. That's the name of the book. We have two main uh, essays there. Uh, one is the the, pro the the indigenous problem, and the other is the land problem. And Mariate's conclusion is something like the indigenous problem. Uh, is actually says Mariate the land problem. No, it's actually a problem of, of, of these communities have been expropriated from the land, no? and they have to politically empower themselves. They have to uh, expropriate now the, the expropriators. They have to take back the land, no? so they can start to build uh, a state and a, and a right. So um, well. You have a lot of struggles for for the land. We have you have a lot of uh, indigenous people taking back the lands and uh, fighting against the landlords. You have a lot of crisis, and it, and it's very symptomatic because it's like the, the the main event of the first half of the 20th century here in Peru. But they don't teach that at schools. You know, I, I I was never taught about this when I was young. And in the university, not so much also. But you have a lot of names of, of heroes, of people who died for, for, the, you know, for, for the cause of, of indigenous people and, and peasant groups who are not remembered. You know, you know we mostly remain, remember Creole uh, heroes from back in the 19th century. So they, that, that's mostly ignored. You know? This is struggle. And this is the struggle that takes you back to, to Velasco. Velasco Alvarado, you might have heard of him. No? He's uh, in the 60s. We have the guerrillas, no? the, the guerrillas in, that mostly tried to imitate uh, the, the Guevarian kind of struggle in Cuba. They were not successful. Uh, uh, Hector Bejar, one of the survivors of, 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 of the guerrillas, Hector Bejar was uh, Castillo's uh, chancellor. He was, no, he was uh, um, appointed as the chancellor of the, the one who had uh, the responsibility of international relations, international politics in Castillo's government. He was the first chancellor. Uh, that caused a lot of an uproar in the media and the, the, the elites, no, the, the bourgeoisie was out, no, outroared. Uh, so they uh, eventually they dismissed Beja, and the chan the chancellors after that were mostly right wing. But I, I will mention Beja because Beja has a lot of uh, writings about his experience as a you know, as a guerrilla fighter in the sixties, and he says something very important that that, that most of the uh, guerrilla fighters didn't actually know this country. Because many of them came from the city, and many of them were like uh, petit bourgeois or creole, and they, they they really didn't know much of this country. And many had Marxist point of view, mostly most of them, 
but it was a very much uh, exported Western Marxism. I, I mean, I, I'm all I'm all in from Marxism. I consider myself a Marxist, and many and many people here do that. But for years, uh, it's it's very much an irony because it was not a Marxism that connected you know, organically with popular movements here. So that uh, lack of knowledge of organ of peasant organizations and indigenous groups and the social relations outside of the coast you know, of, of this country, because the coast is mostly Creole and, and whatever, at least culturally, you know, right, uh, was one of the main factors that uh, led to the um, lack of success of the guerrilla movement you know, and in, in the in the sixties and the Guevara strategy, right? And in in this context. Uh, is that Velasco Alvarado appears. And Velasco Alvarado is very important because Velasco, Velasco Alvarado is a, a very polemical figure. You see? And the Creole elites. Uh, he's also hated by some people in the left, or at least uh, not much love. Many say that Velasco was some kind of uh, fascistic leader that he was uh, actually trying to domesticate the popular movement, something like that. But the truth is, well, a significant portion of the left admired Velasco now, because back in the day he wasn't, the left was, uh, I don't know, like uh, surprised with us all by Velasco. He didn't understand Velasco or his movement. And he's uh, mostly loved by the people. You know, the, the, the people who are from out, you know, from the regions, the people who remember when their grandmothers and their, and their grandfathers were uh, uh, servants, were serfs of the landlords. The people who remember back when they didn't have uh, political rights. Uh, and also people in the cities, in urban landscapes that uh, their uh, fathers and mothers migrated in the 80s, they, they did, in the, in the 70s, they did that because of Velasco. You know, Velasco, as you may know, uh, was a, um, of a, gen uh, yeah, a general of the army. He was from the north, from the north of the country, from the north coast, from Pura. He was Creole, or no, uh, but he was uh, also someone with, a, with an important deal of, of of conscience. I, I wouldn't say class conscious necessarily. He wasn't a Marxist. He wasn't also a, so a socialist. He was kind of center left, or at least he proclaimed himself to be a, a, a center left a Christian man. But he didn't have uh, some an important uh, grade of, of lucidity, I, I'd say, because he understood that the, the cause people were rebelling in the country. The cause, uh, also the guerrillas that, that Velasco himself fought in the 60s, they appeared for a reason. You know, they, 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 he understood that they, there was reasons, there were reasons why this was happening. And there, there were reasons why there were struggles in this country. And he studied a lot of what was happening you know, with, with his circle you know, in the army. They studied what was happening in the regions, he, uh, he studied what was happening with the peasants, he studied what was happening with the land. And in an ironic ironic turn of events, this sector of the army, which it was not all, all of the army, of course, no? you have a, a more fascist right-wing sector of the army also, and a, and a more liberal. But Velasco's group, uh, in an ironic turn of events, assi actually assimilated part of the ideology of the guerrillas that he that they uh, fought before. You know? They kind of radicalized a bit. And he, after he understood that the liberal leaders in the government weren't going to, to, to make the necessary land reforms that this country needed, they made a coup d'etat. You know, and, and they got into power, and, and they did this ref land reform that was the most radical land reform after the one in Cuba. So that's why 
you know, that's why uh, most of the elites actually hate the left. And they proclaimed that they were doing a revolution. You know, they talked about the, the revolution of the armed forces, you know, or the national revolution of the armed forces. And they try to create, and this, I think this is very Gramscian, you know, they try to create a new cultural uh, or a new popular culture, you know, like a new kind of hegemony, you know, in, in the media and because, no, because he expropriated part of the media that was controlled by the elites and gave it to other sectors. And he kind of, ironically for a military government, there was much more pluralism in the media than, than ever. And he, he tried to make like this kind of uh, programs on, and movies and campaigns of media that put in the center the struggle of the peasants. Right, he he tried to create symbols. You know? He he revitalized the figure of Tupac Amaru, who was much forgotten back in, in the sixties. It was Velasco that revitalized a figure like Tupac Amaru as a symbol of the struggle of indigenous and peasant people in Peru and in Latin America. So um, it was an effort to actually democratize culturally, socially, this country even though it was a military uh, government. Also economically, because he actually created a more uh, modern capitalist country. It was feudal before, right? So in the end, the people very much appreciated Velasco. And so him and his government as a continuation of what they have been doing in the, you know, in the struggle for the land before. Also, some parts, some part of the left actually joined the government and tried to radicalize it from within. Hector Bejar, who I already mentioned, was one of them. You know, they were trying to uh, transform the revolution of the armed forces into a socialist revolution. They tried, they failed, but, but they tried. But you also have people in the left that didn't understand what Velasco was trying to do. They didn't even understand what he was. They tried to categorize him, uh, as I already said, Maoists uh, understood Velasco as a fascist, you know, because they said what he was trying to do was actually uh, um, kind of uh, domesticate the popular movement. And many of them even opposed the land reforms. You know, they were very, 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 very radical, almost, I'd say, almost ultra leftist. Right, and some of those sectors, of those Maoist sectors, were uh, Sendero, you know, the Shining Path. You know? And it said that the fact that the Shining Path didn't have uh, success back in the 80s, you know, and this uh, uh, confrontation between them and the popular movements they, were, they, they thought they were representing, you know, that led to many of the killings that happened in the 80s. Uh, it said that it had to do with the fact that the Shining Path um, kind of... Uh, they kept their interpretation of this country before Velasco and, and they, they didn't want to accept the fact that the country had changed. And because of the land reforms, because it was not anymore a country of, of serfs and landlords, uh, the peasants didn't want to... You know, they didn't respond as they had hoped to their problem. I mean, if the Shining Path had done what they did in the 60s, they probably would have been successful. But in the end, it had changed. And the uh, popular movement was very much uh, stronger in many aspects, especially the working class. Velasco was very much uh, power, you know, that the Velasco's government gave a lot of power to the unions and a lot of, of economic rights and social rights. To, to those groups, which actually, when Velasco was deposed, because we has, he was deposed by the right wing in the military, uh, it was the empowered uh, social groups, especially the workers, that, um, how would I say, that deposed the military. And they were the ones who achieved a constituent assemb assembly and a new constitution that took into account more of the rights, even if it wasn't perfect. Uh, the Maoists, again, and not only the Maoists, some groups in, in, the, in the left, any 
in way didn't want to participate in, in the constituent, constituent assembly in the 70s and that affected it's, it's in, in the end it affected it but anyway the thing is that you had a, a powerful working class movement we you had a very much a new self-respect and a new self uh, sense of of, uh, of citizenship in, in in popular groups they thought of this country very much now as as theirs no, thanks to the, the social process that happened in the years of the last government and before. And they were kind of, you had an important sector of the left who was preparing for a involvement in, the, in democratic life. You know, to, 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 just, you know, to fight for power kind of from within. You know? So, and in oh, that context, sorry, go ahead. And in that context, the Shining Path, they started the fight. So that's why they, they were kind of not aligned with what was happening. And why why this is so important? Because the, the, the war in the 80s with the Shining Path, uh, actually, I think it was very, it damaged a lot uh, of what was uh, earned before, of what it had been won. So the, the, the political violence uh, actually left the, the social movements very much weakened, very much weakened, and, uh, and Marxism and socialism very much, very much stigmatized after this, and that actually opened the door for liberals or neoliberals who wanted to. Uh, do the structural reforms that would uh, align Peru with, uh, I don't know, Chile and Britain and, and all of this, right? So, so Sebastian, you kind of give, given us a very comprehensive what has happened uh, since the country got independence in the 60s to the 80s and the war of the shining path, how it's lost the two liberals getting more uh, uh, legitimacy in Peruvian politics. Uh, can we kind of now move to how did then a leftist like Casio come to power? Like you already said, he might not be an ideologically leftist, but at least whose policies are leftist and who's been supported by a popular left base. How did he come to power? And yeah. why was he forced to dissolve his Congress? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's, let's, go, let's get to that uh, quickly. Okay, um, so I, as I was saying, you had a very strong popular movement after Velasco, and it was a kind of weakened after the 80s, and that left open the door for, for Gimori and this new kind of uh, restructured information, and this uh, kind of, uh, this coincided with the end of, of, uh, of the, you know, the USSR and whatever. Uh, the left was internationally weakened and also very much weakened here because of the war. And there was this, there was this kind of, this, I will, how can I say it, uh, a separation of the social movements and the left, of the, and this weakened, very much weakened left. And this separation, this kind of depolitization of the popular movement led to a loud to to change things and to impose his constitution and to uh, take back many of the social and economic rights that they had, they had won. And this process of depolitization is crucial to understand what, ha what happened here, right? Because Castillo is kind of a, a, a heir to these processes because Castillo is a peasant. He, he's a man from the country. He's a rondero. He was a rondero. The ronderos were these uh, uh, grassroots uh, groups that fought the military and sendero no, in the 80s. They defended the communities. So he, he, but he was very young, he was a rondero. And the fact that Castillo isn't a man from the left, that he's not uh, very much politically defined, that he's more of a pragmatist, of a, of a union. That's very, very much a concept 
consequence of what happened to this country you know, in, in, in this process. You know, the fact that that in very aspect he's like a man that that not that not trusts very much politics you know, and and ideologies, political ideologies, right? Uh, that and that that's something that he has. Um, I'd say that's very much what a lot of people here feel. You know that, that uh, political ideologies, even Marxism, they, they are things that don't actually talk to them, right? And and, and they dis, dis very much uh, not trust this, this kind of discourse, right? They, they see it as foreign, or they see it as directly uh, opposed to the idea, very much pragmatic and economic idea of progress social progress that has emerged in the last years, in, in, in the, the 30 years of, you know, between Fuimori and, and Castillo. So, um, anyhow, the fact that he actually won is something that couldn't have happened without all the process says I, I, I've talked before, right? Um, the fact that a man, I mean, that came from uh, the popular movement, the man from a peasant man, that that's something that wouldn't have happened before. But, well, um, with Castillo, you have, uh, after Fujimori, you have the, the what they call, they, they call the, the, the comeback of democracy or something like that, you know, because uh, uh, Fujimori was uh, deposed after a lot of protests, after a lot of, uh, of social and political pressure from the people. Fujimori uh, quit his mandate. From Japan, and he stayed there for many years. And uh, you have the return to democracy, sort of, you know, what they call the return to democracy. However, there wasn't the new constitution. They didn't change the Fujimori's constitution. Uh, the Fujimorian, I don't know how to call it, the, the, the Fujimorists, you know, they, they weren't, uh, many of them weren't prosecuted and they were allowed to stay in political life even though they were compromised with an, even from a liberal perspective a not democratic ideology they were allowed to stay there okay, even though they did prosecute the you know the, the Maoists and, and, and the people from the Shining Path they did prosecute they excluded them from the political life they have not allowed them to Return to political life. They even if they uh, assume the more democratic, uh, non-violent way of politics, that's not enough for them. They, they are not allowed. Their, their ideology itself, it's for it intrinsically perceived as linked to terrorism, right? And anyhow, the the Fujimoris, even though they committed a lot of crimes, they were allowed to stay. In political life and uh, and in schools and in, in in the cultural apparatus and this common sense that economically from an economic point of view you know from this idea that you can separate the economy from the social and the political you know, from an economical point of view things were great you know, there was this idea that the country had grown a lot you know, that that Without the intervention of the left and the, without the intervention of the unions and that had that had become much more weak, etc., uh, everything was great in that aspect. No, that demo the democratization of this country, the, the fact that you had mass migration, or the fact that now uh, people that were not of European descent were much more prosperous or middle class or whatever. That's what's perceived as an economic achievement, an exclusively economic achievement you know, that was uh, that owed it to the neoliberal reforms, and that what what was missing was a democratic political life, as, as something uh, separated from the economic that had to supplement the democracy. And so there was no need for a new constitution. There was no need, you know, because this constitution, the, the, the main thing with the constitution is an economic thing, right? That, that, that it, 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 uh, it strips people of very much, a lot of their social and economic rights, but it also allows things like uh, 
I, I don't know, uh, a company here, a foreign company here can come to this country and make a contract with the state and they can, I don't know, for example, owe for some, for some time uh, lands and that contract uh, ipso facto becomes, becomes um, constitutionally defended. You know, like the contracts you know, with the companies in Peru are, can't be renegotiated. You know, if I find that our contract is not uh, beneficiary for or beneficial to, to Peruvian people, that doesn't matter because the company is you know, constitutionally protected. You know, there's like this kind of lock, you know, constitutional lock that protects. So those those kind of things were seen as fine, right? So in those years, uh, the protests of the people in the country, I don't know, for example, against the mining companies that came to the lands and, and contaminated or, or the fact that they wanted to relocate many of these communities, right? Um, that's what's perceived as um, they, the, the, the media sometimes use the term that it's funny because it's horrific, right? It's a kind of a, um, anti-mining terrorism, right? The, the, the people protested because of the things that the companies did in the lands or whatever they were uh, uh, anti-mining terrorists. Right, they they were using the ghost of terrorism, right, to to spread the, the idea that they were against progress and whatever, you know, wanted the the wars for most of the people of Peru, and then, or if people uh, wanted the, the the state to actually ask them, right, the, 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 there are indigenous groups you know, that claim the fact that that has been the land for centuries, right, and they want the right to be asked by the government. Right? And, and to, to talk with the government, to deliberate what to actually do. If that actually happens, uh, it's, per, it's, it's also perceived as an anti-democratic, ironically, anti-democratic and anti-progress thing, right? Uh, they're perceived as people who are, are selfish and don't want to share the, all of these resources with the rest of the country. And it's, it's really problematic because these are historically excluded discriminated, oppressed groups, but they are seen as the ones who actually are uh, kind of uh, as if they were, they were somehow privatizing no? uh, the riches no? and blocking progress for the rest of the country, right? Alan Garcia actually uh, talked a lot about this, you know, and, and Directly called this, no, the, 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 the indigenous groups that protested as uh, second class citizens. No, he actually said it a lot, a lot of times. So, all of this kind of created a bubble, a bubble in, in Lima and the most uh, urban regions of this country, especially in the coast. A bubble that we were living in a democracy and that we were progressing and if we didn't progress it was because of some strange alien uh, minority groups that were stuck in the past and didn't understand were like like unenlightened and didn't understand what was needed for you know, for, for actually change for the better in this country and whatever so there was this huge division Right, because between the people who actually think that everything was fine, right, and uh, everything would solve the moment we got a, a a nice political party without corruption and whatever, you know, everything could be electorally solved, right, and the people who didn't perceive this uh, economic growth of the of the last years, because, you know. In Peru, I don't know, if you go outside of Lima, or if you go outside of some, of a couple of cities, the hospitals are falling down and attention is uh, terrible and the, the public education is abandoned by the state, 
right? And of course, they abandon it, they don't give money for it, and then they, they got to the press, and the liberal ideologists come to the press and say things like, this is evidence that only private education works and whatever. No? So um, there, there was this uh, tension and this struggle. And in this years, the claim for a popular assembly, a popular constituent assembly, that is plurinational, no, the, in the Bolivian sense, right? That is uh, paritary or whatever, uh, has uh, grown, grown a lot. Uh, it started in the left, but it slowly started to seep into the conscious of the people in the regions. Many people in the region. They started to understand it as, as their own cause. It is, I think, a, a political, we could talk about social learning, right? Social political learning. And um, this gave way to the alliance between, uh, I think, Castillo's union, which was a teacher's union, a teacher's union, and uh, Peru Libre. You know, that it's, Peru Libre comes from uh, this, uh, I would say, popular sector of the left, you know, non non linear sector of the left. And um, against, you know, you know, this other sector of the left that is more middle class and not, not exclusively middle class, but mostly the, the leadership is mostly petit bourgeois and Creole and whatever. And it was this alliance mostly, I think, for sovereignty, for national sovereignty. You know, it wasn't a, it didn't pretend to be a socialist program. It was a democratic program, which was necessary, I think, right? A democratic pro program in the sense that it wanted to take back our country you know, from the companies that came here and did whatever they wanted, they want. And it was about uh, including in the political and social makeup of this country, the, the groups that have, that has have been excluded. Um, there's some noise. I, I can. Yeah, uh, this is Sebastian, can you uh, can you move a little faster? We might be a little short on time. What? I'm sorry. We might be a little short on time. Can we move a little faster? Ah, yeah, of, of course. I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah, um, and so I don't know the, this this uh, understanding that, that there was it was needed a, a, pop, uh, a constituent assembly gave way to the alliance between Castillo and the sector of the left, and eventually after he won the, the first round of elections between Castillo and the left as a whole, with all the contradictions and the differences. So yeah, that that's I, I I'd say that's what uh, actually gave the opportunity, the chance to these groups to actually win. However, no, and, and, and kind of um, burst the bubble of the rest of the country, right? Because they were terrified by the fact that this man from the country with no, the, without the credentials, the political, the educational credentials of, of the elites was taking the government. Right? It was, you know, he, he's perceived very that has not, uh, if not I can intervene a uh, little uh, with respect to uh, Castillo's support base, what kind of, in a sense, uh, Peru in the past has seen many poor and indigenous peoples uprising, and you've also touched upon it. And uh, sense, is the alliance between uh, Castillo and the left more just a political alliance, or is it? Also, an ideological one. No. Ariatekis thought playing this does that still have an effect on uh, Castillo supporters? No, no, no. The the uh, the, the the alliance was not. I, I wouldn't say it was ideological. Not mostly, at least. Um, it was a very pragmatic alliance. Very much a pragmatic alliance because, as I said, the necessity for a constituent assembly became very much uh, a cost of the popular movement in these years, or a, a bigger and bigger sector of the popular movement. Not because necessarily the people have read the constitution or whatever, no? because in the press you got like, oh, but they don't have read the constitution, so what, the, what 
kind of change do they want or whatever. That's uh, very much uh, an intellectualist, you know, elitist perspective. It's just the fact that they perceive and they understand that the institutional order existing doesn't include them or include them just in in name but not in in, the, in practice, right? So that's what they want. They want to perceive an actual change, and they and they know that a new constitution means that kind of change. And also because the, the, they Castillo kind of became a sort of mediator between you know, the political and the social camp that, as I have already said, uh, kind of get the, got a divorce in the nineties after the war. So he kind of got the obligation by these groups that supported him to realize all of these different demands of the different regions. But I could resume this in as a, as a democratic program of a uh, uh, constituent assembly, re, uh, getting back resources, getting back control of national resources, not necessarily to aesthetize them, maybe no, uh, but to, to get the, the last word of what to do with them and the authority of the state no? A, and not uh, constitutionally defend contracts indefinitely, even if they don't benefit the people. And also reforms in, 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 the, in the, the agrarian sector. So those were most of the important things that this uh, alliance wanted to achieve. And as I already said, it, it's not that they had a socialist program, but it, it was a democratic program, no? a, a kind of uh, taking back many of the rights, right, that uh, the people uh, had been denied in the last years. No? It's, so um, this wasn't as, as, as we've seen. This wasn't achieved, right? And it, and the, the left has a lot of responsibility here. Castillo also, of course. But the left has a lot of responsibility here because um, the left in Peru has become in the last few years very much, uh, how would I say that? There, there's very a lot, a lot of opportunism in the left, right? So many, their support of Castillo was very much conditioned by the fact that, I don't know, if they had ministers or if they had people around Castillo or not, so if they didn't, they immediately became opposition. That's uh, not only valid for no Peru and the more middle class left, but that's also valid for Peru Libre and the ones that came to power with the steel, right? Yeah, uh, if I can make a point here, is that why uh, a lot of the support for Castillo was withdrawn after his coup failed and after he was arrested also a lot of the support from the left that were earlier support of him uh with true support also if you could uh, touch on your rural peru and all over with the indigenous population are living you've heard that uh, uh, the march to lima took place you've heard that universities have been shut down so what is the situation right now if we can touch upon that also in short okay uh well i i, I you know it's very very much the the first question you you, you wanted to know if the the podcast you have been getting was after the coup uh, uh yeah I, I, Yes. Uh, okay. Why? Why does? Why was okay. the support withdrawn? I think you also touched upon it a little, and we can. Um, the next question the first question is, 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 I mean, Castillo, even with, with all his mistakes, because he made a lot of mistakes, a lot, a lot of mistakes, and you could say that many of his mistakes have to do with the fact that Castillo wasn't a political man. I think, right? That he didn't have an ideological perspective, and, and I don't know. Like he was very much a union man, and as a union man, he was a pragmatist, and and that affected a lot of his decisions. And he also had a, 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 a healthy, I think, level of paranoia. He didn't trust very much the left or anyone. So he kind of isolated himself. But anyway, um, even with all his mistakes, Castillo, the, the people always saw Castillo as their president. Uh, and the people, I, I mean the people in the regions, I mean the people that the people that supported him from the beginning. 
no, the, the popular movement, the peasants, the indigenous groups, most of them, you know, there's always contradictions, but most of them, they supported him, they always supported him. Even when the left, many of the most radical people in the left were saying things like, no, but the Castillo is a traitor because he didn't do this and he didn't do that, and, and he, he doesn't have an ideological perspective, and, and he reasons like a liberal, or whatever. And in many ways, they were right. But as I already said, Castillo is a man, he's not a, a Marxist, he's not a socialist, he's a common man, he's a person, right? Who came from power, a teacher, a common man. That's one, and that was the thing that connected him with the people. That they understood that with all his failings, Castillo was one of them. And that's was a, a, a very, very much a democratic Jewish. And they still, after everything, trusted that he was there for them. And that he, as long as he was trying to do what they demanded from the beginning, they would support him. And he failed because you talked about this before. You know, I, I, at, when I, at, at the beginning of his death, he was uh, the, the Congress and all the, the powers in the state that were against him didn't allow him to do many of the things he wanted. But the people understood that. That he was, I don't know, like that there was this opposition that they were trying to take him from power from the beginning. You know, that the, 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 they, they wasn't a the elites and a lot of the political uh, organizations of the right didn't want to recognize still the fact that they had democratically won and that Castillo was representing them. They even tried to annul at the beginning their votes. I don't know if you know that when the elections came, they wanted to uh, annul most of the votes of the South. But anyway, so when he was deposed after he tried and, and, and he tried this very badly, they, they have, we have to say this, that when he tried to, to close Congress, uh, that was very much uh, badly executed. He, I don't know who, how they decided or, or what way they were, exactly how they were trying to, to do what they tried to do. They, they did it very badly and he was betrayed by the military and, and a lot of people. After that happened, uh, because of the reasons I, I'm, I'm telling, the people got out. Of the houses and, and started to, to, to march and started to protest because they want all of these things. They want the constituent assembly, they want to take back the sovereignty of the resources, they want, and they, and many of them, not all of them, but many of them want Castillo back. Uh, many of them don't want him because I don't know, they probably because they, they, they think it's not possible for him to return. Others, Probably, probably because they they think uh, a new leadership might be better. I don't know, but the thing is, they are protesting because of the same reasons that led them to uh, choose Castillo as president, right? And Boluarte was supposed to be on that same boat, and she is always said that she would quit if Castillo got deposed, and she didn't, and she decided to govern. Aligned with the with the by the same powers, the very powers that deposed Castillo, and that are trying to block the Constituent Assembly and to make it illegal, and even to to say that um, demanding a Constituent Assembly is a terrorist activity. You know, in, in the some prosecutors have said that directly because they say that's a demand from the Movadet. So the Movadev demand popular uh, constituent assembly, the demand itself is terroristic, right? Which is crazy. So um, right now, uh, the uprisings started uh, in the south, started outside of Lima, in the regions, you know, in Lima, in Puno, you know, in, 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 the, in the Andean regions of, of the country. But they have very quickly spread to a lot of other regions, and uh, it's and it, I mean, it's actually very surprising because there's a level of organization, of political and social organization that we hadn't seen in many years. It's like the, the social movement has acquired a level of conscious consciousness that we hadn't seen in a lot of time, uh, and and but this has been answered with uh, political repression with very strong political repression. Uh, in two months of 
of government of Guinea Duarte, we have already almost, I think it's more than 60 people killed right now, right? And people that have been, um, we, we, there's this consciousness that, that Lima is very important. Even if Lima is like the most uh, reactionary part of the country, it is, I, I think it is. You know, Lima is the most reactionary from a political perspective, from a social perspective, is one of the most reactionary, if not the most reactionary region of the country. But it's, the thing with Lima, it's that, it's almost another country, but the thing is that it's, it's uh, one third of the population is Lima. It's a lot. So there's this consciousness that we, they need Lima. You know, they need Lima to, to achieve success. For their, for their demands. So there's this uh, take of Lima, you know, that, that they need to kind of metaphorically siege the city, right? Which is something coherent with the spirit of these movements from the very beginning, because uh, size that, that, for example, just I, I'll try to say this briefly, but when we had the elections, um, a sector of the left learned that the way to win was to siege. You know, they wanted, they, they had to win the regions, they had to win the people in the country, the peasants, the working class. When the other sector of the left, the one was not with, that was not with Castillo, thought that they needed to win the middle class or something like that. You know, in the coast, maybe, right? So in, it was this, the first spirit that was right, and this is very much in line with that. You know, that's something. That's the one thing that a sector of the left had right. The fact that so now this is manifesting in, in, in these new protests, right? That they need to make themselves uh, seen. You know, that they have their existence have to be made uh, recognized by the, the people in Lima, no? because you have this thing like, oh, but why are they protesting in, 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 in I don't know, in, in the rich districts, right? Because they, 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 they will not achieve anything here. Why are they here? And they, you know, I, I'm talking about the elites or, 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 or a sector of the middle, or the so-called middle class yeah, that has this kind of, that I don't know what, how they understand the process, but they, they don't see the point in that. And, and that's very important, actually, the fact that they make themselves visible, you know, that because they make their cause heard by a sector of the country that, that mostly ignores them. Um, but they have also been persecuted here. Once they, they, most of these leaders and delegations from the regions came, they have been persecuted uh, when they were housed by the universities, the police got into San Marcos and they have been arresting them from, I don't know, if some of them have, uh, if they found that one of them has a book about Marx, for example, that could be very well being a, a present from a student, you know, like something like that. Well, that's a proof of uh, terrorist activity, right? Or, or some peasant delegations came here and the police planted them with machetes. No, because when Castillo won many of the peasant delegations that came to Lima came with machetes, machetes. and the press were, were like, oh no, they're ringing weapons and whatever. And, and, you know. So the police were planting machetes you know, on, 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 on the delegations that came, right? And trying by any means they could to show this protest not as legitimate democratic protest, but as kind of a dangerous extremist uh, organizations, right, and, and criminal organizations. So, uh, right now, that's very much the, the, I don't know how to say, the panorama here, right? But uh, one important, very important thing is that in the last week, uh, in Lima at least, in, um, these popular movements from the regions have found a new ally in the urban popular classes 
of this city, you know, which are culturally link, uh, and historically um, linked with the people from the regions because the, the, the poorest people in Lima and many of even and even many of the middle class in Lima nowadays are the, the sons and daughters of migrants that came to this city in the 80s and the 70s. Right? So they, there's a new solidarity there and that is something that we could be optimistic even if these protests eventually fail in, in many of their demands. There's a new, I, I think there's growing some new consciousness, right, of the, of the, uh, of who, who, what are the forces, the political forces that are clashing here, you know, of the fact that you have a popular camp and an oligarchical camp. That's, that's very much getting clear for many people here. And that's, uh, and I think at least that's an ideological picture. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Sebastian, for answering my questions. I think now we can open the floor to question and answer questions from the audience. We have uh, 10 more minutes left. Okay. So we have a comment in the chat box. Uh, Comrade Shaurya says, the populace during the historic farmers march, uh, farmers movement in 2021. The feeling of disposition under neoliberalism in rural areas in Peru and the form of political mobilization it is giving rise to is something that we sh is something that is uh, that we share in India also. It is observable in India also. If you would like, uh, the so-called pink tide in Latin America. Uh, and the continuous assault of the global north, especially the U.S. on it. Uh, where do we look at this going? Uh, do you think there's a possibility of some kind of coalition between progressive governments in Latin America against neo-imperialism? Neo okay. Um, first, okay. The first question uh, or commentary. I think that's right. Right. Yeah. Um, I. I I have to confess that I'm not very much. Um, I I don't know many about um, the Indian context, right? I'm kind of ignorant in that. I confess, but what I do know, what I have learned, mostly because of comrades uh, like yourself um, and uh, an important figures. Um, I don't know. Um, I know uh, comrade Prashad, and, and uh, what I have learned shows me that we actually have many many things in common. There are differences, of course, but because of our colonial uh, history and uh, because we've been for many years ag agrarian societies, right, and, and at very much still are, uh, there are similarities and parallels between these movements. Uh, I think uh, that's a common ground, but here, I, I think. I, I think, uh, anyway, anyway, because of particularities of, uh, of our histories, my impression is that in, in India you still have a very strong, at least in some groups, in some regions, it's very strong political consciousness. You know, I, I think, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I've seen, I, I don't know, uh, it's still a lot of uh, Marxist organizations, and uh, very a lot of people that still identify themselves as Marxists and socialists, and uh, have very much present their history, right? The, I think here we lost a lot of that progress in the eighties after the war. We lost a lot of that, and that has uh, set um, that's like an obstacle here, right? The fact that it's like the movement has to start again in, some, in a lot of ways. And they are doing it because, you know, the proletariat, the peasants, they learn. They eventually learn from the struggle. And I think we can be optimistic that that's happening, but I, it will take a lot of time. Uh, and there, there are no political left-wing organizations that have uh, made this link 
an organic link with the popular movements. The, the left wing, the left wing organizations are very much uh, set apart from the popular movement, and that's uh, that's a shame because these uh, uprisings would have been an excellent moment for an uh, organization that could actually talk to the people and get to know the people and get uh, by their side and even eventually let the people into a strong political movement and not just social movement. But this, that, this doesn't exist. Yeah, that, that, I was that, wondering that. if you could share a little bit about Maria Tegi's thought, particularly his writings about the indigenous question, because that's something I think is also very specific to Peruvian reality, but also has some generalizable aspects for Marxists everywhere. If you could share a bit about uh, his theoretical uh, context. Okay. okay. Um, well, just to end this, uh, the other point, uh, I think that's the main obstacle, at least from the perspective of Peru, to achieve some kind of international solidarity with, with, with the countries, the other left-wing countries, the fact that we don't have that political conscience. Even Castillo was very much a strategic, uh, tactically kind of aligned with those countries, but he didn't, I, I wouldn't say he identified himself with, with a, a broader you know, internationalist sentiment, right? Anyway, um, as for Mariates, um what could I say? I don't know. Mar Mariati is very important because he he's kind of the father, of, I, I would say, of uh, specifically Latin American Marxism, and that's a honor for for us Peruvian, right? We we are we, we are very much at least the, the ones who are identifying themselves as leftists and socialists and Marxists. The fact that Mariati is our countryman, that's very much a thing that makes us proud. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, when 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 uh, before Che became Che, you know, he he was here as a uh, medical student, and one of in one of his experiences here in Peru was that uh, a political man, very very famous political man here, actually presented him with a book of Mariate, and one of the first things he read about Marxism was the Seven Essays. So and they also share a I don't know if you know this they also share a birthday they they, they, they were born same, on the same day so yeah that, those are the pillars I think of Latin American Marxism Che Guevara and Mariate right and the thing with Mariate is that he understood very well that we couldn't just export Marxism as it as it functioned in Europe and in Russia right that we actually had to we couldn't think of socialism as something that kind of established a, a, a trajectory that copied what happened historically in Europe, that, that didn't make sense, because this was a country that back in the day was mostly indigenous, and it's still mostly peasant, so agrarian, right? So the conditions were very much different, and nonetheless, Mariate opposed a liberal solution, right, that, that now we can't have socialism because we are still backwards, so we need a liberal organization. That didn't make sense to it. So we actually had to build uh, a proletarian and popular movement that think about socialism and political revolution from the historical, specific conditions of this country. And that went hand in hand with a kind of um, very much, I don't know, very, very similar in some ways to some Gramscian and some Maoist things. Right? The, the fact that he saw the, the peasants and the indigenous movements as a political and revolutionary agents that had to work hand in hand with the proletariat. He was a Leninist, so he thought that the proletariat would let this movement and, and everything. Thing, but, but he saw them as protagonists of history. He didn't saw them as many uh, uh, Creole Marxists. He didn't saw them as some kind of ch children that had to be taught by the working class. You know, he just saw them as historical revolutionary agent, agents. That's very Maoist. Even though I think he didn't read Mao ever. And, and also this uh, Gramscian thing, no? that you had to build 
a, a culture, an ideological culture that would strengthen and, and uh, coalesce this group to take this country and eventually to organize uh, political institutions that actually work uh, in favor of these groups and with, with socialism in the future, no, in, in, in view, right? And another very important thing of, I, I think of Mariatri's thought is the fact that he was very critical of these perspectives about progress, right? of always seeing forward, never, never it's, uh, backwards. Mariatri has, uh, for Mariatri, history was very important. Not only in, 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 in the idea, the classical uh, historical materialism, but history as, as tradition, the things that, that, that were ingrained in the struggle of the people. No? This uh, like accumulated historical political experience you know, of the colonial times, of the colonial struggles, of the, of the, in, like the cultural and linguistic identity of this country that had always been shamed uh, by, by the Creole elites, you know, as something backwards. Right? That's, that's what, for him, that was very important for, for a struggle, and for, for the class struggle, you know, the, the recognition of the past. And uh, this kind of uh, heritage, right? This Thank heritage, you. Uh, so I think, Sebastian, we... It's been almost one and a half hours you've given us, so just short on time. So if you have any finishing remarks that you want to take a minute or two for, and then we can uh, end the meeting. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, there was some interference. Oh, okay. uh, so we uh, our discussion has gone on for one and a half hours, uh, and you've kind of come, come to the end of our time together. Do you have any finishing comments you want to make? You can take a minute or two for that, and then we can end. Okay, um, just just the fact that um, here, as, as I've already said a couple of times, uh, the fact that uh, Castillo wasn't a socialist, yeah. And, and I've seen many people that uh, criticize the, the, the fact uh, here in Peru, but also from outside of Peru. Even thing, right? But it's important to understand that because of the historical conditions of this country, we, but what, but the most urgent thing right now, and the main demand of, of the, the, the popular movement, and this is something that, that political organizations, especially socialist political organizations, have to understand, is the fact that what we need right now is a democratic revolution. That is the first step before anything. We need a democratic revolution that guarantees that uh, the popular masses have uh, a political control of the state. And the thing, we have, let's say the, the, the next step, the social revolutionary step, uh, you know, the social revolution, that comes after. You know, right now, what what we need is to get rid of the social pact of the you know, this institutional order that was founded by the neoliberalists back in the nineties. That's the most urgent thing. And right now, that's something that, that the people understand very well. And socialists we have to get uh, behind that. So, yeah, I I think that would be the thing. Yes, that was a very comprehensive cover you gave of the what is the crux of your argument and what you think is necessary for the immediate future. Oh, we have another question in the chat box. Maybe if we can answer this in one or two sentences, that would also be really helpful. Uh, the indigenous people's question is also the forefront of the recent conflict in Chile. With the new left-wing government's approach not being any more left-wing than that of the previous governments, are there any co efforts at coordination between the Peruvian and Chilean movements? Um, I wouldn't say that, actually. I would say that um, it's a shame, it's something really sad here in this continent. But I think there's very much, there's a lot of isolation between indigenous movements in Latin America, I think. Um, there's much more, you know, like dialogue 
for example, with Bolivia, because in Bolivia we have uh, Quechuas and Aymaras and CO2. No, that's actually why, uh, for example, Boluarte is accusing Bolivia of interfering and wanted and being behind uh, the protests and whatever, because there's this solidarity between those groups and this movement, right? But that's not something, uh, regrettably, that extends, I think, to Mapoche and, and other groups. And, and I think it, it, that has a lot to do with the fact that there has been a kind of depolitization of social movements and popular movements in, in, in a lot of Latin America. No, that, that, that uh, indigenous solidarity international solidarity. It comes with a political agenda. It comes with a political ideology. It's not something that spontaneously comes from just from the fact that supposedly we share or they share a common identity. So, and and there's also, as they say, there's also this, this historical breach between the indigenous movements and more Creole leftists that I've mentioned a couple of times already, right, in, in, with the guerrillas and the fact that even with the good intentions, and I, I myself, myself I, I'm a Creole, no, I'm a leftist, socialist, whatever, but I'm a Creole. And there's a distance that has to be politically mediated. And there's a lot of, like, I don't know how to call it, but may, maybe uh, class prejudices or whatever, but it, there's, in a sense, a lot of times, but many left-wing organizations from more more urban and real uh, regions, they don't make the the efforts and they don't make the they don't make the right steps to articulate themselves and to actually know and gain that earn the trust of these groups and movements. So that's detrimental not just for the left and themselves but also for these movements so yeah uh, i would say that uh thanks one more question in the chat box is there a tendency within latin american decolonial there is a tendency within latin american decolonial philosophy of considering Marietti as a decolonial philosopher. Do you agree with this? In a sense, I think the question is whether would you consider Marietta Gia more of a decolonial philosopher or more of a Marxist? Yeah, okay. Marxist? Um, well, let's say this. Uh, I, I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, there's this kind of tendency in the academy, right? Uh, this, like, I don't know, this fashion, decolonialism, whatever. Marietta is a Marxist. There's been, I think, an effort, a conscious effort from a lot of groups to kind of de Marxize Mariate and to take Mariate for a more culturalist, even liberal point of view. I don't say that the colonials or self identified the colonials in the academy or whatever and activism and, and stuff, I don't say that they are liberals. But the, the, it is, uh, there's a common thread no, of taking Mariate for a more um, cultural thing that has not to do with uh, necessarily and the capitalism or with socialism. So, but let me say this. Um, beyond the academy, the colonialism, as they call it right now, but that I understand is actually anti-colonialism, anti is a Marxist thing. Uh, there have been groups that have been anti-colonial, not just Marxist, but Marxist, Marxism outside of Europe at least, has always been anti-colonial. And Mariette is part of that. And even authors, intellectuals that are important for for this decolonial movement in the academy, like, I don't know, like, I'm thinking of Dussel, and, but especially Quijano. They have been Marxists. I mean, the Quijano was a Trotskyist with all the problems that has, we would we know that had, but, but he was, he has a depth with, uh, with Marx. And the best in Quijano, what, what's best in Quijano, that's an author that we can criticize in a lot of points, but, but he's lucid in others. Uh, it has to do with his depth with Marxism. And I, I think he would have never say that uh, Mariati was not a Marxist, even if he saw him 
as a heterodox, right? But I, I, I mean, what great Marx is has not been a heterodox, right? Uh, Lenin stuff himself as a heterodox, Mao was a heterodox, Stalin was a heterodox, Che Guevara was, and, and Fidel were heterodox, right? Lenin himself was a heterodox uh, parent back in the day. So, yeah, Marete was heterodox, yeah, but he's a Marxist. And he, and he was also a Leninist. So, I don't know, if, uh, whatever we call the colonialism it's today, if it's uh, if it has the right to call itself like that, well, it, it, I think it must deal with Marxism, and it must um, it, it can't do that kind of separation. And I think they they underestimate Marxism and they underestimate the story of anti-colonial struggle of Marxism. They, then they are not really anti-colonial. I, I love that answer, Sebastian. Thank you so much for that answer. And thank you so much for giving us your time, answering our questions properly, taking us through things in such great detail. I am so this session has been very informative for all of our participants. And we hope to have interactions with you in the future. And I would like to end with uh, solidarity and uh, red salutes to both you and all our uh, all the protesters in Peru.